I'm sure the first thing you want to know going into this review is if I liked Metal Gear Solid 5 so that Kojima and Metal Gear Solid fans alike know whether or not to mash the dislike button and unsubscribe like some people did with my Ground Zeroes review. Well, you know what? I loved Metal Gear Solid 5 The Phantom Pain up until the ending, but that's a spoiler-ridden video for another time. It takes some warming up too, but once you see, once you get, once you're hooked and see past its flaws and its shortcomings, you can see nothing but true potential underneath. The execution is a bit sloppy in some departments and the ending feels a little rushed, but I'm still playing it and enjoying it immensely, so they must have done something right. You know, I was a bit critical about Ground Zeroes, and, you know, I, that's because I was judging it on the $30 disappointment that it was. If it was free, it would have been a completely different story. And I hear Kojima wanted it to be free, but no, Konami would have no part in that. No. Oh. <laughs> and you may have noticed I have come down with the rare strain of vocal cord parasites. I got them from bronze! I'm sorry... Well, that's okay, though, because my vocal cord parasites make me sound handsome. Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain is the long-awaited final chapter of the Metal Gear saga that took over five years to build on an engine capable of sustaining an open world. Fans expected nothing short of greatness as they eagerly boarded the hype train. Since its release, the game has received a plethora of perfect scores from critics and wild fanboys and girls alike, most of which obviously before they even finished the game. Which leaves me a bit baffled because by no means is Metal Gear Solid V a perfect game. It's a fun game, it's a great game and there's plenty to do, but it does not hold up against the previous Metal Gear Solid titles. And hell, besides one or two missions, it doesn't even feel like a Metal Gear Solid game besides the gameplay. I am going to digress for a second and read one specific user review that sums up the experience in a nutshell. I got a chance to play and finish this early in my country. The only negative points were pacing issues, some repetition and inconsistencies with gameplay, and not as much development as I'd like for Big Boss. I like the base management and dark themes, but I can understand these things aren't for everyone. Other than that, it's a fantastic game with great presentation and insane gameplay. Of course it doesn't go into a lot of the negative critiques with the game, but I am soon to get into that. I'm not saying you can't like it because I like it, and I'm not saying you can't add it to the Metal Gear canon because it is an official Metal Gear game, but I am wondering if everyone is still smelling that new game smell and is unable to see these flaws with their rose-tinted nostrils, and I feel it is up to me to set the record straight. So I am going into this review critically by pointing out the bad and, of course, the good. Previous Metal Gear Solid games directed the experience for you with a deep story and interesting characters, whereas this game is more like a make-your-own experience, with very little story to get in the way of that and dull characters with absolutely no character development. To me, Metal Gear Solid was always about the story and characters. That's what gave me incentive to keep playing in the past, even though the gameplay was also really fun. But in Metal Gear Solid 5, after a big explosive prologue full of mystery that has you clinging to the edge of your seat, the game nearly falls dead in the story department, and as an avid Metal Gear Solid fan, you may find yourself grinding just for advancement in the story. I started to do that myself, but gave up on the story early on because if you grind, you just won't enjoy the game the way it was meant to be enjoyed. Any cutscenes that seldom occur should be considered a treat, but that's just disappointing. No cutscene should be considered a treat, not in Metal Gear. Hideo Kojima said in a foreword of the piggyback official guide, if previous installments were each a movie, Metal Gear Solid 5 is an episode TV series, and this holds true with its mission-based structure that act as episodes and chapters that act as seasons. But I'm not quite sure if this layout works for Metal Gear, and I'm pretty sure it wasn't executed as well as it could have been. An open-world tactical stealth espionage game has never really been done before, so kudos to that. It must have been quite an undertaking for Kojima Productions. There are a total of 50 missions in the game, and over half of them do not progress the story in any way, and over a third of them are repeat missions on higher difficulties. I think this story could have been dispersed 
first better across the game and every mission should advance the plot in some way. It doesn't help that this was a rushed game, as evidenced by the hacker community finding a title image for Chapter 3 and the extra disc with the collector's edition containing crucial cut content. Apparently, the game was supposed to be five chapters long, with an epilogue, and what we got was only one and a half chapters. Although unconfirmed, here is a list of the original plan for the mission structure from a Portuguese member of the press revealed one month prior to the game's release, and it is just baffling, if not depressing, the game did not turn out this way. If this is no hoax, this would make the game a third of the final intended product. There's plausible reason to question the credibility of the source, but a lot of the mission titles match up with the ones that made it to the final game. Kojima may be under a non-disclosure agreement, so we may never know. The first chapter in Metal Gear Solid 5 went rather smoothly, then after that it goes downhill, forcing you to replay missions from the first chapter on higher difficulties to extend the game length, and it just gets tedious and feels like a lazy cop-out. There's only a few more story-driven missions, then the game is over with the worst, laziest ending in which I saw coming from the beginning of the game, leaving lots of loose ends in the story. Hell, I saw the plot twist coming after watching the trailers for the game. The least they could have done was handled it with finesse, in which they didn't. It's too bad this was a rushed game because it could have been perfect. While Metal Gear Solid 3 had the best balance in gameplay and story, Metal Gear Solid 4 was created more with fan service in mind as it was supposed to be the last, last, last game, therefore overdoing the story to tie up all the loose ends. Metal Gear Solid 5, on the other hand, has barely any story and an abundant amount of gameplay. The V in Metal Gear Solid 5 stands for many things. Kojima says victory. V may even stand for Venom Snake, or the fifth snake. But it also stands for vengeance, and everyone is just out to get revenge in some way. Revenge! But the game never leads up to the big V against Cypher and possibly Vegetable Zero and other things I wish to not spoil, and doesn't do a good job showing the downfall into villain territory with Venom Snake, and there's no bridge between this and Metal Gear 1, unless you want to consider a timeline scrolling up the screen a bridge. In that sense, because of the incomplete story, it does not close the loop on the saga. What we ended up getting was an incomplete game and Konami is obviously to blame. They were likely sick of waiting and put the pressure on Kojima Productions just so they can get money in their pockets. I'm sure Kojima had no other choice but to cut a lot of the story out and set a release date to please Konami. After all, the CEO makes the decisions regardless if Kojima is happy with the final product. This is the most expensive Metal Gear game to date, with the longest development period, which may have led to the downfall of Kojima Productions. Konami is about quick and easy money as seen by their gambling trade and is likely why they are shifting to mobile games now. Kojima likely boasted to Konami that the Fox engine would be financially viable, but no developer has picked up on it yet. Konami doesn't care that true art takes time for the real satisfying experience their customers want, that being the gamers. I'm sure the experience that we were looking forward to would have at least taken another year to completely finish the game, but in Konami, art and business have collided on many occasions, especially with Team Silent. Konami is the reason Team Silent departed or got repositioned in the company. This is just history repeating itself now with Kojima Productions. Or, uh, I mean, Unit 8? Now they're Unit 8? How demeaning is that? I'll show them my unit! I think this issue between Kojima and Konami could have easily been resolved if they split each chapter up into separate games or DLC and release them periodically. It would have brought in more revenue for the company and it would have likely meant a finished and fleshed out game. Possibly everyone employed with Kojima Productions would have gotten to keep their jobs if they planned it this way from the get-go. I mean, I'm not in the biz, so perhaps that's easier said than done. Personally, I, and I know I speak for the fans here, wouldn't have minded waiting and shoveling out more money for each finished chapter of Metal Gear your solid five. As far as acting goes, Kiefer Sutherland is a hit and a miss. A lot of times he devolves to just grumbling and glaring. Especially on the tapes and other times he just sounds like Kiefer. That freak show back there. May the work of your children too. He doesn't talk a whole lot anyway, so that makes him an extremely awkward character. I wouldn't want to be around that guy. There were certainly times I felt David Hayter could have been better and at least have been more coherent and emotive. Kojima Productions said they got Kiefer for his facial capture range, but he barely emotes in his face and has the same expression a lot of the time. I don't see the big deal, why they had to pay a big time Hollywood actor's salary for something someone else could have done much cheaper and better. The best overall acting has to be from Huey Emmerich, played by Christopher Randolph. The most interesting character has to be quiet because she's so damn mysterious. And I'd hope you didn't kill her, otherwise the story would be lacking even more. Ocelot just looks and acts like Troy Baker, and there just isn't enough of Miller. Besides, he's just bitter and angry now. Understandably. And unfortunately, there's no character resolve or development. 
This time around, they cut the codec calls and put them in your inventory as cassette tapes, which I guess is an improvement. I like being able to play while I hear more input on the story rather than just sit there as it drags on and on. But without codec conversation between two or more characters, you miss out on some good character development, like in past games. What I do get sick of is Troy Baker tripping in to tell me wormwood is used to make my cigars. Okay, I get it. How many times are you gonna have to tell me that? And I just wish Troy Baker would stop interrupting me while I'm trying to listen to cassette tapes. He totally breaks my groove when I'm jamming out to Hall & Oates. Speaking of which, I never expected this in a Metal Gear Solid game, but a big incentive to sneak into bases is to find that hit early 80s song and add it to your mixtape collection. Of course, they went somewhat cheap with the song, so no Toto, Tears for Fears, Heart, Depeche Mode, or David Bowie, but wait, there is a David Bowie cover by Midjury. It's a rendition of The Man Who Sold the World from 1982. Still nice though, and the lyrics are very fitting. Some songs you pick up were created in-house with an 80s feel and aren't half bad. Hell, it's the background music for this video right now. And you were wondering why you were jamming out through this whole review. There is one big elephant in the room that I must address. An elephant can barely fit in my room, so I need to let it out. Nothing pulls me out of the immersion more than the the obnoxious credits before and after each mission. They only spoil which characters will be in the mission and if it will even be a story related mission. Hey look, Skullface will show up. Also, sometimes in the middle of a cutscene, you'll get a to be continued, which leaves me going, why can't you continue it now? It's not like I'm going to stop playing. Metal Gear was always meant to be played for long periods of time. It's not like a TV show where you gotta wait a week for the next episode. If I played one mission a day, I wouldn't beat it for months. At the end of chapter one, and at the end of a certain character's story arc, you'll have to sit through the end credits, leading you to believe the game is over time and time again. They could have easily added a credits option on the main menu and include the credits for who worked on each individual chapter. There is no reason for this excessive amount of credits. Perhaps this was a form of retaliation as Kojima knew his studio was being shut down, his name was being removed from all the packaging, but it's excessive! Just excessive! Not spoiling anything significant in the story, but there is a part where you have to kill some bad kids with guns under government orders. As inhumane as this may sound, but if I'm under strict government orders to murder defected child soldiers, then I should have the option to do so. I mean, why would it be game over if I do? You want to kill kids? No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying the option should be there. The government wants them dead, it's a government contract, so why is it a mission failure if I kill them? Honestly, I don't think you're allowed to kill kids for the same reason the WWF doesn't allow animals in combat zones. What, the World Wrestling Federation? Oh, what does that have to no, do with it? Oh, the World Wildlife Foundation. They changed that acronym several years ago. You should know that. All they're doing is restricting my fun. That's it. So you want to kill kids? Yeah, why not? You said no just a second ago. All I'm saying is the option should be there. All it's showing is that the big bad big boss that's supposed to be circling the drain into villain territory has a soft spot for African children. Snake has a heart. You're just an evil person. You know what? You're the villain. Even Kaz wanted me to kill them. See, listen. They can't go home. They've only got two options. Heaven. Well. See, I told you. Miller? No, not Miller. He was my favorite character. Yeah, but then he had a change of heart. This is what he says when you kill him. Boss, you killed a child. I'm aborting this mission. He still hates kids, though. No, he doesn't. Yeah, he does. No, because later he says that he remembers when he was a kid and he just wanted someone to understand that maybe he could be that person for those kids. Well, maybe he changes his mind, but he does hate kids. He says so here. Never like kids. Especially ones with guns. <laughs> Whoops, my finger slipped. Oh, come on, get up, stop playing, you're fine. Oh my god, you killed a kid? I, I don't know how to think of you as a person anymore. It was a hunting accident. Huh. Um, l l let's talk, let's digress and talk about something amazing, like the no, gameplay. this is an important issue. No, yes, the gameplay is a great thing to talk about. 
The gameplay is perfect and controls wonderfully. I know I struggled with it a bit in Ground Zeroes, but the overall mechanics have slightly changed and I got used to them. I don't have a single complaint about the gameplay and I am very much looking forward to Metal Gear Online. All the things I complained about in the Ground Zeroes review was addressed in some way. Regenerating health is much slower and is upgraded throughout the game. Seeing marked targets through walls isn't as bad as they only flicker once in a great while. The automatic cover system is tighter so you won't accidentally take cover from running, and it takes a little bit more force to break away. The wild and crazy dodge move doesn't look as wild and crazy anymore and has helped save my life on many occasions. Now, instead of getting right back up after this move, you immediately go prone. You can even play dead again, but I haven't found a good place to use it and not get caught. Many tools can be developed, such as the decoy that distracts guards long enough to get behind them and fault in their truck. Fulton is definitely a fun mechanic, and it never gets old, and helps you get more resources. There's also knocking to distract guards in cardboard boxes which can be used in a large number of ridiculous ways. There are so many fun ways to go about infiltrating bases that I am back to wanting to be sneaky again and only going lethal when desperate. If you liked Peace Walker, this game is like 100 times that in scale and continuing the storyline in a lot of ways. It has the same tactical squad management system which took some getting used to, but I just fault in every guy I knock out anyway in auto sorted departments that best suit him. In a way, you can compare the gameplay to Monster Hunter 4. You choose a mission, you go out on it, you gather resources to build more equipment, you find Palico which are like soldiers and send them out to gather resources for you. Peace Walker even had a Monster Hunter mission, so they knew what they were doing. I'd also like to note, the more the more heroism you gain, the higher ranked soldiers you're able to recruit. There's a secret demon points that's essentially aesthetic, grows your horn, and covers you in blood. Not sure if this changes anything story-wise though, but I thought I'd mention it because most people don't know about it. The artificial intelligence of the soldiers can be pretty dang predictable with many repeat animations and scripted routes they always take. Other times they can be pretty unpredictable in their vision as they can spot you from a mile away while other times they could be standing right next to you and not have any peripheral vision and not see you at all. In an open world such as this, it makes sense they'd be able to see further off and it's your job to mark and get a good idea of each base's layouts and guards patrol routes. This gameplay does get pretty repetitive after a while, especially when a chopper can't land any closer than two miles away from the target area. What? Why can't I be dropped off any closer to the mission area? Pequod, but let me let me offer a year. Pequod, Pequod. Ah, oh, fuck you, Pequod. Okay, I guess that's where buddies and vehicles come in. Quiet and D Dog make excellent buddies. Quiet marks targets that you may have missed, and you can command her to fire upon them as a distraction and to knock out guards before they catch you. D Dog is great at marking targets and even mines, and you can even equip him with a stun knife to knock out a lone guard. But you want to be careful with him as he can be shot and pulled out of the mission area. D-Walker is a mechanized killing or stunning vehicle that acts as a buddy and is extremely fun to drive around and gets you places quick. If you're far enough away, you can dual wield tranquilizers and knock people out to capture a base fairly quickly. Then get the hell out of there before reinforcements come. Oh man, it's amazing. The D-Horse is... <sighs> horse, and controls kind of funky, funkier than the way vehicles control. I pretty much stopped using the horse when I maxed out my bond level with him and stuck with the other three buddies. As you increase your bond level with the buddies, they become more obedient and more options unlock for them. You can make the horse poop. Totally game of the year. There are so many little details that make this gameplay so much better than the past games that I can barely contain all of them in this review. But most people playing the game won't even know about these details without a little digging and again, my chief complaint is poor execution. I'll go into a few. While it is unfortunate there is no gameplay difficulty selection besides the select few missions that are on higher difficulties, the game kind of makes up for that in a really secret and smart way. But you probably wouldn't notice anything different until about a hundred hours with the game. On the iDroids map, you may notice these symbols Symbols. They range from gray, white, pink, to red. They are four different stages of security. The game actually learns how you play and builds defenses against that. The first one is if you get spotted using the Fulton a lot, they'll be able to shoot them down faster. The second one is if you get a lot of headshots, more people will start wearing helmets. The third one is if you take out a lot of outposts undetected, they'll start amping up the security with cameras, decoys, and mines. The fourth one is the opposite of the third one. If you take out a lot of outposts while in alert state, they'll start wearing heavier armor and using strong 
stronger weapons. The fifth one is based on infiltration at night. If you infiltrate at night a lot, more guards will be present using spotlights, night vision, and even flares. The last one is if you snipe a lot, including using quiet. The bases will adapt to have more snipers or even gunships stationed to be on the lookout. Something else that's pretty cool is if you use gas or smoke grenades a lot, enemies will start to wear gas masks. The game adapts itself in a groundbreaking way. Also, the longer you go without showering or visiting Mother Base, the lower your reflex mode, health, and health regeneration will be, effectively making the game slightly harder. There is also a fast travel by using a cardboard box on one of these platforms after acquiring a tag on the post, but you can only travel to other bases you've gotten the tag for. It saves you time and the GMP for calling a chopper when you're trying to finish all the side ops, which are aside to the main missions and very few are actually story related and get repetitive. A lot of the missions, both essential and non-essential, have to do with capturing specialists and prisoners. The gameplay rewards you get for collecting and faulting resources is the ability to build up your mother base and zoo. That's right, every animal you capture gets collected in a zoo. And building up your mother base expands the amount of soldiers you can carry, essentially upgrading the level of each of seven different divisions that help you in various ways, such as the R&D department, which depending on the level, determines what equipment you can build. There's also a second mother base you can build later on that requires MB points, which are expensive microtransactions to secure and expand your multiplayer hot zone, also known as FOB. The store description on MB points say it's an in-game currency that may be used to shorten development time for certain weapon items. Maybe being the key word. Though I have never found a way to use MB points to do anything of the sort. But recently I think I figured out what it means and what MB points actually do. The more FOB bases you build and develop using MB points and in-game resources, the faster the development time of raw resources items and weapons. In short, it adds to your current mother base and processing times. Also, I did notice I was able to increase the amount of staff I can assign per unit for each FOB platform I developed. If Konami wanted people to buy this expensive stuff, they should have made it a lot more clear. But, I am afraid of building up my FOB because that means more resources will be accessible for people to drop in and steal. I can't afford that and also, I can't afford it. I've been desperate for fuel resources since the beginning of the game. Now, if there were microtransactions for resources, uh, that would be a different story, um, but a game breaker, so thank god that didn't make it. People online will invade this mother base to steal your soldiers and supplies. Also, FOB missions are random. You get a list to choose from, and most of the time someone is already invading that person. Because of the random nature of FOB, you can't team up with friends, and that makes it unappealing. This whole innovative mechanic can be fun if you have the real money to spend and resources to build the base up. Sneaky Kanon. One thing that kind of stinks is the development and deployment times progressively get longer and longer as you progress. I'm at the point where it almost takes two hours to deploy a small army in the field to collect resources and three and a half hours to build a new platform for Mother Base. This is all done in-game, in-game time, and doesn't continue when the game is off. But you'll have plenty of missions and side ops to do and cassette tapes to listen to while you wait. Another thing I feel I must address is the so-called open world. A half of the time you are stuck to the open roads because of giant rock walls or end of mission areas on both sides, unless you're in free roam. So basically you go from outpost to outpost with very few shortcuts. Granted, there are some open environments, but I wish there were more. What it comes down to is the illusion of an open world for half the game. But that's a nitpick on my part. My favorite open areas, though, are in Africa's jungles, where it really feels like Snake Eater, and the Skull Sniper mission is the best and feels so much like the end's boss fight. Oh my god! Even more so than Quiet's initial encounter. As far as the ranking screen goes, you can easily get an S rank by completing your main objectives as quickly as possible. Possible. Sometimes it's even okay to kill people as long as you don't get caught. It's all points based and every little thing factors in such as reflex mode, alerts, checkpoint retry, special objectives, and most importantly, time. But it's not a good idea to shoot for the S rank on your first playthrough because if there are cutscenes, they cut into your overall time in which it should not. Watching cutscenes should have no effect on your rank, and they certainly do. In ending, there's a lot of gameplay to offer in Metal Gear Solid 5, The Phantom Pain. And you can replay any mission you want at any time. But I'm already getting burnt out, and the incomplete story and awful ending really hit me hard. Especially after finding out how much of the game may have been cut out. It's a great game as far as an incomplete game goes, but it just does not stack up to the previous games, and I am not a huge fan of this mission-based TV drama setup or the tactical operations. There was a lot of potential here, but poor execution. And in my 
120 plus hours with it, there just wasn't the payoff I was hoping for, leaving me feeling a phantom pain deep down inside. Perhaps this was the plan all along and Kojima is just an evil genius. But there's no doubt in my mind that Konami's greedy intervention is what resulted in this incomplete game that I just wanted to love so wholeheartedly. I just don't like doing rankings anymore, but just for the sake of this review, and to help you decide if this game is for you, I'll make an exception this one time. As a game not associated with Metal Gear, it definitely deserves a 4 out of 5. But being a Metal Gear game, which always so heavily focused on story, I'd give it a 3 out of 5. It certainly did not live up to the hype for me, is rushed and incomplete, and just wasn't the direction I was expecting a Metal Gear Solid game to go. I also wasn't a huge fan of the story or execution of Peace Walker. So, I think it's fair to, you know, meet somewhere in between and give the game a 3.5 out of 5 for its shortcomings. What do you say? And for the people that can't do math, that's a 7 out of 10. I'm sorry if that's not the review you were, or, or score you were hoping for, but I think it's well deserved. I'm still playing it weeks later because the gameplay is so damn fun, but I try not to think about the story too much though. Uh, what did you think of the review? You think, you think it was fair? You are a child murderer. You are an evil, heartless person. Those children's lives were just beginning. They were so innocent. Uh, regardless of that, um, the game, uh, what did you think of it? No spoilers, though. Me? Oh, well, I, I really liked the story. It wasn't really what I expected, and I wish there was a lot more character development. But the, the cutscenes, there's a scene in the game where it's just and then there's that one scene midway into the game that's just so so good. I just tore my shirt. And and I love the quiet. She made me cry. And Miller, I love Miller. Whatever happened to Miller? He dies a sad, lonely death in his apartment room with no one to grieve him by Ocelot's hand. Oh, I grieve him. Oh, Miller. a shining light even in death don't worry he's a diamond in the sky now And they will get no mercy.